get started with the first talk here. It's on why open table formats and why now. And my goal with this talk is just to set the set the stage, make sure we're all on, or get everyone on the same page as we spend the day talking about Apache Iceberg and open table formats more generally. So some definitions, some um, history is basically what this uh, talk is about. So, so yeah, my name is Shantana Thule. Uh, I got started in uh, particle physics, analyzing massive data sets, um, where I was doing the data engineering and the ML engineering. Uh, then I worked as an ML engineer uh, at, at a, a company with an NLP-based product, so uh, conversational AI. I uh, was a machine learning engineer there. Um, then I started going into more product-focused uh, data science roles. Uh, so I worked at a managed um, airflow company. Where, uh, we, where I did data modeling and some ML and started really thinking about product strategy. And now at Upsolver, I do some data, but uh, a lot of my role is focused around product strategy, which is how do we build the best version of Upsolver that other data professionals are gonna find useful and uh, be able to use. Um, so that's me in a nutshell, and that's my puppy. Uh, she's a little bit older now, but her name is Ridge. She keeps me, uh, she makes me get up from my desk and, and walk around and she's great. Um, okay, so we're gonna start with sort of, um, this is a, you know, a like a sort of broad lens thinking about the evolution of uh, how, we've, how we store and access data. So um, databases are great, they're natural ways for of storing and accessing application data, but they're not ideal for running analytics, right? And you don't wanna do that because it affects the performance of your um, application. Uh, so the solution in, in some sense is a data warehouse, which is really more of a business concept than a technological, um, like a, a specific tech. It's about a way to model your business using the data that's generated uh, by the business and you know, putting it in a, in a structure that's easily accessible or that makes the data easily accessible. Um, it's essentially, I think of it as an interface that you have with your business data. Um, but this, the primary purpose is sort of business intelligence and analytics. And as other use cases emerge for the company, such as machine learning, it's not always the most ideal solution because um, the data is already modeled in this use case specific, use case, uh, use case centric way. So it's not as easily adaptable to ML. So as a way of resolving that, we've got, next slide please. We've got data lakes, right? So data lakes sort of bypass this extensive data modeling and this prescriptive interface. Um, you get a lot more direct control with how your data are um, sort of organized and how to access them. Uh, and this makes it adaptable to other use cases such as ML. Uh, data lakes are also great because they're, uh, the file formats are open, uh, it's easily pluggable and you know, modular. Um, and it also unlocks a lot of cost savings compared to data warehouses. Um, however, more control means more having more know-how. So uh, with a self-managed data lake, you have to worry about um, how to compact your data, how to update your data, and like how to con continuously maintain. So well, that one of the biggest pain points with data lakes is the continuous maintenance of the lake. Um, and the other issue is uh, if you have a data lake for ML, which, you know, for example, we did for this NLP-based uh, product, then that sort of, again, serving uh, that use case really well, and it's optimized in that way. But for analytics, you sort of have to have another layer still, that interface, you're, you're missing that interface to actually run uh, human queries against your data. Um, so I, I sort of think of it as a query index. So the data lake has a lower query index than a data warehouse. So this is how I, sort of, I think of query index. As you optimize storage in some ways, um, it's it's all it's a trade off against the query but query ability of your data. We can even um, think of this as um, so. For example, the the warehouse is you know really queryable. It's not necessarily the most optimized way to um, store your data, and that's why you unlock a bunch of cost savings when you move to the lake. Um, even within the warehouse, you know, if you think about it, uh, normalized versus denormalized data. Data becomes more queryable, and for your to answer your questions, if it's more denormalized, but it's more efficient and, and better stored if it's in normalized format. 
Uh, and then there's data, there are data files, such as like parquet files, for example, that actually have the data as, as lines in the file. Um, and those are more optimized, but you know, the, you have to really know the mapping of where what data lives in which files, so they're less queryable. Um, if you add a metadata catalog on top of your data files that you know has that information about where different pieces of information are, then what you get is a data lake. But in going from a data warehouse to a data lake, you've made the trade-off uh, of queryability for gaining more optimization and storage. So there's, that's where the data lake house sort of comes in. It's essentially, I think of it as a, a combination of lake-like organization, warehouse-like interface, and database-like transaction support. It's like the most succinct way that I think of a data lake house. Uh, so what does that mean? It's warehouse-like because you can like you can write queries against the data. There is a language. There is a uh, grammar around how to how to access the data. Um, you can have uh, typically like uh, the warehouse um, like component comes with things like access control, um, compaction, retention, and certain um, certain procedures around that. It's database like in that it brings acidity to the lake. So you have acid um, transactions. Um, and again, we're increasing the queryability. It's SQL uh, as a way to access your data. Um, and then finally, it's lake-like because it's still just, you know, you, you're storing the files. It's not abstracted away. Someone else isn't like uh, organizing your data. It's still just files in open format um, that's living in a blob storage somewhere. So you have all the cost benefits and portability. Um, our, our CTO likes to describe it as a, as a semantic layer <laughs> uh, on, on data, which I think is, is quite great. Um, okay, so with that mishmash smorgasbord, um, you get some benefits, efficiency, performance, uh, updates are easy, compaction's easy. Um, you get things like the merge on read pattern uh, and dynamic maintenance of the table. And you can get back to closer to the business model or the uh, model for your business as in the warehouse. So in this, uh, going back to this framework by adding a metadata management and like maintenance layer, we have um, to the, the other data lake co uh, components, we have come to the data lake house, which is both high in queryability and storage optimized. So that's a transition that you're making, that we're making back up now towards in this axis. Um, so how is this actually achieved? So this is where the open data format or open table format comes in. So that's gonna, gonna be a phrase that we're gonna use throughout the day today. So let's just uh, sort of define that. Um, so a table format is here in opposition to a data format. So you've got data formats like Parquet, um, Avro, et cetera, that sort of is how the data are serialized and stored in a file. And the table format is sort of the specification on top of that uh, of how the entities represented in the data are actually organized and distributed amongst those files. So it's almost like the entity concept from a database, um, just sort of in this table layer. Um, so it helps with query planning, it helps with knowing where the data are, but uh, importantly, it is not, uh, a table format is not a query engine. That's why you need a separate query engine on top of a data lake house to actually query the data. Um, and then open, where the open part comes in, uh, what comes in is, it's open as opposed to proprietary. So most data warehouse services, right, are actually doing this. It's just, uh, they have data stored in a certain format somewhere and they have a way of organizing your data. That's how they make the tables, the materialized views, et cetera, and let you query the data. But it's proprietary, it's behind a wall. And any cost benefits that they're gaining from you know, using uh, the cloud for optimized storage is uh, kept by by the vendor that's providing this as a service. Um, so when you go to open, it means it's open source, it's uh, vendor agnostic, it's portable, uh, and there's some standardization when you have an open 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 source um, table format. Then you know you have multiple different teams, people uh, working on it, and mostly it gives you a fra standard framework for interacting with your data. Um, and you can now serve different use cases. Um, so different departments will often use 
have different tool preferences, right? So you can, if you have an open open table format and a lake house, then it's easily pluggable to all of those different businesses. Um, and again, like just like the lake is easy to migrate, you just change the catalog. You don't necessarily change the data format. The data lake house is also easy to migrate. So a lake house is a, as an emerging term. It's not the same as an open data format. Um, a lake house can be a well-maintained uh, data lake also that's easy to update and queryable. Uh, there are good ex examples of good data lakes out there, uh, but it can, a lake house can also be based on an open table format such as Iceberg. Um, so for me, a data lake house, these are the important points, uh, parts of a data lake house. It's a combination of database, warehouse, lake properties, like sort of best of all worlds. Um, it uh, is helps you create uh, an amenable, like data that's updatable, queryable, and highly usable interface. Um, it's for data storage, organization, and access. And it's adaptable to many use cases. So these are like the four strengths of a data lake house. Um, and that's why I think that it's the future. So uh, welcome again to the first ever Chill Data Summit. We're going to talk about more, much more about lake houses and iceberg and table formats. Lots of experts here that are going to share their um, better viewpoints of, of what I just, just presented.